how much E. coli 0157 there is in, in wild deer populations. And there's another study looking at um, potential risks for contamination of, of venison carcasses um, during the growlicking process um, uh, through to the final pro uh, uh, product that goes onto the shelf for human consumption. And then I just sort of make a point here about uh, an update on some added value projects. What, what, what we thought was very important for this project is that um, we're collecting lots of samples. We're asking um, uh, gamekeepers and deer managers and the Forestry Commission to submit samples to us at Morden, and we're very keen for these samples to be used for other projects. And it kind of goes back to the question, should we be collecting samples? Um, what's become apparent over the last you know, two days is that there's lots of, um, uh, lots of uh, prevalent studies or studies on our deer populations with a very, very valuable biobank of material that be, could be used for lots of different projects. And I think it's, um, it's just amazing how engaged the, the, the deer um, sector is in collecting these samples for us to do research. And I think uh, some sort of joined up kind of, you know, way of sharing samples would be, would be really good for the future. So, so why are we interested in E. coli 0157? And I've said E. coli 0157 and other Shiga toxin producing E. coli because basically 0157 is a serotype of E. coli that is most commonly associated with human disease, but there's a, a, a range of other types of E. coli that also have this Shiga toxin which is co causes the problem. And the reason is that um, it causes disease in humans. So basically, I've just got some snapshots here from the press. Usually when you hear about an E. coli o uh, outbreak, it usually is 0157 in the UK, uh, and it causes disease in people. Um, it doesn't cause any disease in, uh, in livestock, so it's um, a bit of an unusual one for us to work on at Morden because we usually work on diseases that cause production losses or welfare issues in the animals. But this is a real, it's a real uh, problem in, in the human population. This is um, uh, just uh, looking at sort of infection rates uh, in people um, in the UK. And basically, and what you can see here is over time, this is the cases per thousand of the population. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to attempt to put a, which one is the middle at the bottom, middle at the bottom yeah. So basically, um, this is your uh, case incident rate, and this is tracking uh, from the mid-80s when it first emerged as a problem in, in uh, basically globally, but in Scotland that's where we first started seeing the cases. And what you can see is that um, uh, the cases um, sort of gradually increased from the 80s and have remained pretty sort of static really over that time. Scotland has the inevitable um, uh, position of having the highest incident rate in the UK and it's one of the highest incident, incident rates of E. coli 0157 infection in humans globally. Um, the reason for this we think is because Scotland has particular types of strains of E. coli 0157 uh, extending into the north of England um, which seem to be um, more likely to cause um, human disease. And the reason it causes disease is because of these Shiga toxins. So these are toxins that are encoded by these little critters here. These are bacteriophages. So they're viruses that infect bacteria. So what you'll find if you look at lots of bacteria, then they'll be infected with these bacteriophages. And what the phages do is they, they insert themselves into the bacterial genome, so the bacterial DNA. And then when the bacteria, usually when it's under stress, um, uh, the, the, the virus decides I want to get out of this bacterial cell before it dies so it starts replicating and then gets released and infects more, um, more bacteria. Now it just so happens that the, the, a certain um, a bacteriophage, a certain virus was carrying the Shiga toxin gene which is this toxin gene which causes the disease in humans. So what it does in humans is it attacks uh, mainly the lining of blood vessels and causes blood vessel damage and that's why you get um, uh, bloody diarrhea but you can sometimes get some quite serious um, kidney um, uh, damage as well due to this attack on the blood vessels. I in cattle and all of the livestock, we think um, uh, the disease is not caused because um, the toxin uh, doesn't attack the blood, blood vessels um, of those species. So what you can do here, this is just a thought I'd show you this kind of quite neat sort of little diagram, but basically what we're doing now is we can sequence the, the, the whole uh, genome of these E. coli and then we can use a technique where we look at a mutation rate of E. coli and we can sort of use a sort of molecular clock to work out how strains related to each other and how they're related over time. And so what we think is there was some ancestral um, O157 that had um, this Shiga toxin 2C. So it's a, there are different subtypes of the toxins. So it's a 2C subtype. And you can sort of track to see how the lineages that we see, so different types of the E. coli O157 have evolved. And what you can see, uh, see in this slide here is that um, 
around about sort of uh, 100 years ago, um, these bacteria started um, uh, uh, to, to, they were infected with a, a Shigatoxin 2A subtype. And we think that this is linking to why it's, done, it's such an, uh, sort of, uh, um, a disease that's, a, that's only just emerged in the sort of the last 50 or so years, because this is the toxin type that causes the most severe disease in humans. And we've been doing work on cattle, which is, we think, the main reservoir of E. coli. And we think it's really important for high shedding of, of E. coli on 5.7 and for transmission between the strains. So I think, you know, I'm just telling you this because if I report this again, I'll put it into context of uh, how many E. coli we see with this toxin gene. But it's cer certainly something we're, 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 we're concerned at that 2A toxin is actually becoming more prevalent in our, in, in our um, cattle populations at least. So just some points here about um, 157. Some further points is that the reason that we're interested in it is because uh, ruminants are, are seem to be the main reservoir of E. coli 157. So you don't really see it in any other sort of livestock. You don't see it uh, in any other mammals, really. It really is a, a ruminant-specific uh, problem. So uh, sheep, goats, cattle, uh, and obviously um, there's interest in deer. But it really is cattle that we think are the main um, sort of reservoir of infection. And if uh, we've had three big prevalence studies in Scotland over the last two decades, pretty much giving us the same prevalence estimate, which is about one in, one in five farms will be positive for E. e. coli 157 at any one time. And if you go to those positive farms, it can be anywhere from about 5 to 8% of the, of the samples that you take are positive. So there's a lot of E. coli 157 out there um, in, in, in our cattle populations and, and potentially in the environment. So that's just to sort of put it into context. If you look at sheep, there's very little data actually on sheep, but um, <coughs> it seems to be less in sheep. And in deer, um, we have very little understanding of deer. The, the human infections are usually caused by direct or indirect contact um, with ruminant feces. So, you, so sometimes an outbreak is really obvious. So uh, you might have, uh, a lot of people might have eaten uh, undercooked uh, um, beef burgers, um, and then you can link the outbreak to there. There was a big outbreak in a petting farm uh, down in Surrey, which was associated with goat shedding 0157. Um, and in that, in that case, a lot of children got infected. But the reason I'm talking to you today is because um, of an outbreak of E. coli 157, it was uh, contained this Shigatoxin 2 um, uh, um, uh, uh, to type of toxin, and that was associated with consumption of ven venison burgers, sausages, and, uh, and some other processed venison. And that, that was in October 2015. I think 11 people were sick. Um, uh, and basically, this was the sort of really the, the inception of the project. So basically, uh, members of the venison industry came to Morden. They were talking about another project. This was in 2016. And they asked, does anybody work on E. coli 157? Uh, we want to know a bit more about the situation in deer. Of course, we, we, um, we sort of reported back to them to say, well, the prevalence of E. coli 157 in deer is really uh, unknown. So we can't really assess, was this a one-off? Or is it something that's going to be, you know, we're going to see repeated outbreaks of E. coli 157 associated with venison products. There was a survey done in, in the early 2000s by Bharti Singh as part of his PhD, and he collected about 700 samples of, from, from deer, deer fecal samples and couldn't find any 0157 at all. So we were assuming that it was actually going to be quite a low prevalence in, in, in Scotland, but we didn't know whether that's changed. Um, in certain other surveys, you'd say maybe the prevalence is about 1%, so we expect the prevalence in deer to be much lower than it is in cattle, but we, have, we had no evidence to, 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 uh, to back that up. So really, the project was funded. We managed to, after about a, a year of getting funding, we managed to get co-funding from Food Standard Scotland, who are obviously very interested in understanding the risk of 0157 infection through, through venison products, and, and also where they wanted to understand, are there any uh, processes within the graliking to the, to the final product that are actually causing, uh, more likely to cause contamination of the carcass with fecal material, because that's where the E. coli is. So this is essentially this, the project. What's the risk of E. coli infection and what can be done to reduce it? This is the project that we, um, uh, we had funded. So basically, the first objective was, um, uh, was to map the venison industry in Scotland. This came from Food Standards Scotland because actually they had very little understanding, actually, of the venison industry, you know, where the venison comes from, how much is coming from the cull, how much is coming from farm deer, how much is imported. So it's very sort of basic information that, um, 
that your food regulator you'd have thought probably would know, but um, certainly there was a need to understand this a bit more because they were coming from the point of view of if they have an outbreak, then basically they want to be able to have an understanding of where the, the venison's coming from so they can try and trace back. What I'm going to talk to you today, uh, uh, just to set up is basically objective two. So that was a, a field survey to assess um, the, pre the prevalence of 057 in, in, in wild deer because basically uh, that was unknown. And the reason that we want to know this is to see, you know, is this, uh, how, what is the likely input of 057 into, into venison? Is it, if it's very prevalent, then obviously that's a higher risk. If it's, it's not very prevalent, then it's going to be low risk. And then the third objective, which is uh, led by University of Edinburgh, uh, they were really looking at the processes from graliking to cull. So trying to look at sort of um, do some microbial, microbial assessments. So looking at bacteria on the carcasses before and after skinning and at various points from the graliking process to try and understand is there something that we're doing uh, when we process the, uh, the, 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 the venison that's going to be uh, causing more cross-contamination and can we improve the, uh, the best practice guidelines on that. I've just, uh, I've just mentioned that these are the added value projects here. So we've got quite a few added value projects here. Um, as part of the, the sam fecal samples, we're looking at antimicrobial resistance. Really as uh, deer, uh, as sentinels for antimicrobial resistance, this is a big issue for us now. Um, we know that the antimicrobial resistance is a problem. There are not very many more antimicrobials coming onto the market and we need to sort of understand um, you know, sort of what level of resistance there is there so we can try and uh, assess how, how any sort of um, uh, future strategy to reduce it will is impacting. There's a, a bit of a work on parasitic worms. Uh, uh, do you see the same worms in deer that you do in our livestock? And is there some sort of uh, infection um, sharing there? Uh, cryptosporidium, so I'll go into that in a bit more detail, and chronic wasting disease. So, so basically, we have been collecting tissues for chronic wasting disease, but we're archiving it at the moment. I can discuss that maybe at the end if you want. This is our workflow. So basically, um, so this is now focusing on the, uh, the field survey. So this is the workflow. So we, what we request is we got a fecal sample. This was taken um, at the larder, so when the, the carcasses are being um, processed at the larder, we get a fecal sample. And what we do is we enrich it for um, uh, E. coli's and then you do this test where you, um, you try and pull out the E. coli 157 and then what we've done with the, sequ the, the strains that we've collected is we, we actually just sequence the whole genomes now. It's really cheap now. It's uh, about 70 pounds you get the whole genome sequence of that isolate. And the, the beauty of this is we're doing this with the Scottish E. coli reference lab so they can map the strains back to do they look more like human outbreak strains or do they look like more um, uh, cattle strains that are not being associated with, dis with disease? So we can get a lot of information about not only detecting them but giving some understanding of is this likely to be a problem or not. We can enumerate the numbers of 0157 from, the, from any positive sample so we, we know how much um, a bacteria has been shed by that one individual. Uh, and then we're making certain that we store samples for say for example cryptosporidium analysis we also got rectal tissue, uh, but that's now been archived. Um, um, at the moment, um, Mark, Mark Douglas and I both work at Morden. We went to, to speak to the Scottish Government. They want us to archive these samples and not actively look for chronic wasting disease. Um, that's, the, that's what our funder has told us to do. So um, we basically, the prevalence study, um, what we've done here is we've basically, we powered the, the, the study, so to look for the number of samples we have to collect to get a, an accurate prevalence um, of 0157, to, to look for a 1% prevalence. So we're, we're, we're expecting it to be really low in, in deer. And what we did is we sent out sample packs to the deer management groups, um, and we sent sample packs to the Forestry Commission. And uh, we sort of split, we, we tried to sort of try and get a balanced kind of sample set. So. Uh, for the deer management groups, we tried to go for 50-50 hi you know, hinds and stags. Um, and for the Forestry Commission, they gave us all their information about the numbers of deer they cull for the last decade, the species, uh, the sexes. So we could actually weight um, uh, the number of uh, species they collected each month, uh, the, number, the, the sex, the sex uh, balance. And, uh, and so, that, so we get a, what we wanted to do was be able to get a, sort of a, um, a, a consistent supply of samples from the Forestry Commission over a year period, which we've actually managed to achieve um, uh, because we knew that sort of the deer management group samples would come in a wave during the culling season. Um, this is just um, a, a plot that Margaret Chase Topping did at the University of Edinburgh, but these are all the sort of the Forestry Commission ladders. 
and we chose three large larders and three small larders from some the, the southern, northern and middle regions um, to try and sort of get more of a balanced sort of sample set. Some of you in the room probably have seen one of these sample packs, but these are sample packs we sent out. So we've got the, the sample box, a padded envelope. This is a fecal pot for your fecal sample, and this is a formalin uh, pot for fixative pot uh, for the rectal tissue sample. We also requested um, uh, um, cull location, um, sex, uh, species, um, condition score, um, approximate age, and whether there was any crow grazing with other herbivores. So we get, we've got a lot of information out of this survey. I would love to be able to stand up here and say this is the prevalence at the moment, but I can't sit tell you that because basically the survey is still going on until the end of uh, June. Uh, if I tell you a figure now, then basically that'll be the figure that everyone quotes, you know, as in the final figure. So it's not the final figure. Um, uh, but I can give you an update of where we are here. This is up to, up to, to May. So we've just got over a thousand samples um, and I've divided it into deer management group or forestry commission group and it's pretty balanced between the two um, uh, sampling sets. So I think we've, we've got a really nice sample, sample set um, and as I say, we, we have been analysing them. Uh, and this is just to give you an idea of the location. So this is all the samples, so uh, split down into the different species. So you can see that um, uh, we've managed to get all our sort of regions here and as you'd expect, you know, uh, where your species are, you know, they're sort of uh, largely sort of split between the reds here and, th and the rows here. And we've managed to get both these pockets of, of fallow deer as well. Um, just to split it further, that's the Forest Commission sample set. So we relied on them to get a lot of the lowland samples and that's the deer management group. So we got a lot from the, the, um, the, the sort of the, the highland deer management groups. So all pretty successful. Uh, what I would say is that um, uh, we, we, we powered for a 1% prevalence and we're probably not going to be far off that. The third objective, um, so I'm just um, now talking about other people's work because we're doing the prevalence study at, at Morden. This is other people's work. So this is basically um, uh, Christian Soar and Alex Seguino from the, the Dick Vet. Uh, they're, they, they're lecturers in public health and they're doing the, the cross-contamination survey. And so what they've been doing is they've been going across They've selected um, five different um, uh, um, uh, game handling establishments um, across Scotland, and they've been looking at c carcass swabbing for, for not for all 57, but just for general E. coli, which are kind of tell you how much fecal contamination of a carcass is, there is. And they've been doing it sort of uh, inside the carcass before and, and outside um, before skinning and then repeating it after skinning. And this is kind of, you know, um, their sort of breakdown of what they've been sampling. So they've been sampling 135 reds, 77 row, and, and only three seeker. But they've just been going into these handle game handling establishments and sort of, you know, um, and taking their swabs while, the, while everything else is going on. So this is the samples that have been taken. So um, this is kind of just the sort of the, I guess, the um, a sort of a, a, a cartoon of exactly what happens um, from, the, from the cull to the, the packing and labeling. So they've been, uh, they've been taking swabs from hide and skin, swabs from cavity and, and skin on, and environmental swabs. And then once the, once the skinning and trimmings happen, they're taking some more swabs again and environmental swabs. And then finally, they're taking meat and environment samples. So uh, I guess the summary of, of this work is that they're, they're actually finding, they do find E. coli, as you probably predict, um, but probably not, not, not at worrying levels, I would say. Um, this is just an example of their sampling. Uh, so they basically have these little swabs. Uh, they go back to the lab and we look for, for just general E. coli. So we're not looking for dangerous E. coli, just general E. coli. So that's really sort of where we're at at the moment. Um, uh, and I just thought I'd give you just a flavour of a couple of the other added value projects. So um, the chronic wasting disease, as I say, we have a sample archive. So I guess, five minutes. So I guess if there are issues with them, uh, chronic waste and disease, then there's an archive to go back of rectal tissue to screen for chronic waste and disease. Um, uh, the parasitic nematode worm survey is basically telling us that they, they do have some of the similar sort of worms that you have in our livestock populations. Um, but I'm just gonna sort of briefly talk about crypto and antimicrobial resistance. So cryptosporidium, uh, cryptosporidium is a really big problem in farming uh, because it co and, and it also in, in deer farming because it causes this really sort of profuse diarrhea in young calves, lambs and deer. And, and it causes like, can cause uh, quite severe illness and potentially death. It's quite resistant in the environment. And, um, uh, and basically there's a lot of interest now in looking at uh, cryptosporidium 
and the transmission between livestock and deer to water supplies. There was a study in the, in the Cairngorm showing that um, uh, deer can carry crypto and it can infect water supplies. And the reason that we're kind of interested in this is because the water industry is really worried about sort of, uh, you know, the safety of water in, in various catchment areas where there's deer. So, so what um, Beth Wells has done at Morden is she's been processing our fecal samples and what she'll be doing is using a PCR to type the crypto. And then the final sort of uh, slide here is really um, what we're looking at is we're looking at um, antimicrobial resistance in the fecal samples as well. So basically once we get the samples, once they've been screened by us, uh, then basically what um, Derek and Nuno are doing at, uh, at Morden are basically there, um, uh, they're, they're looking for uh, resistance to common types of antimicrobials and, and they're doing some more detailed work on a, a subset of those. Really, this is to try and understand, you know, in the environment, you know, what's the level of antimicrobial resistance? Because, of course, none of these deers have had antibiotics. I'm just going to skip through um, these slides here. But basically, um, what, what um, Derek's doing is he's looking at, you know, influencing factors. So if you find antimicrobial resistance in deer, does it relate to any of these, um, you know, sort of uh, human sort of uh, or these, these points here? like for far farms or, you know, populations of humans, hospitals, waters, uh, um, uh, wastewater treatments, for, ex for example. So none of that has been done yet. But basically, this is the idea of kind of what we use in these samples for. And this is my final acknowledgement slide, just to say that um, thanks to lots of people who have been involved in the project. Mary, Mary Mitchell has been doing all the work in the lab for the OM57, and Christina has been doing all the sampling for the, um, uh, the cross-contamination survey. Um, Derek is the PhD student on the AMR resistance. And I'd just like a big thanks to, um, to Dick and, and Richard who have really sort of driven this project forward. We've got this steering committee which is uh, full of excellent people um, including John Fletcher, Jimmy Simpson, Leo and John Bruce has now come onto our steering group meeting, so a committee. So, um, uh, so we're trying to link in with BDS now. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. At what risk am I in that I might not know whether the, the carcass itself is contaminated? So I think, you know, you, you'd be assessing that so sort of grossly, but there would be no way of you being able to assess whether that carcass had O157 or not. So I think it's, I don't think it would be your responsibility if the carcass was, you know, was positive. I, I think actually at the moment the, the traceability is probably not not adequate for you to trace it if you did find it the back to that um, original carcass in this unless we do these sort of prevalence studies here um i say probably the prevalence is going to be pretty low but there's no, there's nothing you could do looking at that carcass to know whether it's positive or not we try to look for like is there any clinical disease is there anything that these 0157s do to ruminants that you know is negative because we're, we've, have, we've developed vaccines for cattle but, uh, to try and reduce the risk to humans. But the issue is that there's no incentive for farmers to vaccinate. So we've been looking to say, is there anything that's negative about e these, these E. coli's uh, on, on impacting on health? And the short answer is no. <laughs>